Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, I'm going to give a talk about uh, the potential of a large-scale electric fencing policy in Bhutan. Um, I don't know, who has been to Bhutan from your, this audience? I know at least my colleague has been to Bhutan. I've been to Bhutan many times. I did my PhD on Bhutan. I don't see any hands. Oh, you have been to Bhutan. Great. Yeah. So probably you have heard about the human wildlife conflict in Bhutan. It's basically everywhere. Um, in the south, it's mostly elephants. Um, wild boars cause problems basically throughout. I mean, if you see white spots, it's just because there's no data. We've asked uh, agriculture extension officers which animals are causing most problems. Wild boars, monkeys in some regions, deer. Um, and of course, there's also livestock predation, but we focus on crop raiding. Well, how do they do uh, have uh, mitigated human wildlife conflicts so far? Mostly traditional methods, um, crop guarding, some conventional fencing. You see a rather poor fence on the right hand side, making noise and fire, setting up traps, other methods. I will briefly talk about which ones. Hunting is severely restricted in Bhutan because of uh, Buddhist beliefs and of, because of also policies. Um, and farmers became very creative. On the left you see a scarecrow uh, dressed in the national go. Yeah? Um, I don't know if that is more impressive for animals. On the right you see uh, a stuffed tiger. Uh, farmers have bought stuffed tigers to uh, scare off monkeys. Obviously monkeys are clever and find out after a few uh, days, well, you can wag the tail and it's not gonna roar, so it's not so effective. But uh, it made the news at least 12 years ago. Well, these traditional methods are quite, effect are quite effective if you look at crop losses. I hope you can read those figures, it's a small screen. Um, I mean, maize is very much affected, um, potato as well, um, but it's, that's not really the big economic loss. The big economic loss comes from the labor. They spend about, um, yeah, from peaks of 16 to 27, um, person days or person nights to guard their fields per acre um, and that is a high amount of total work, total labor input, about a third in, in maize for instance in the dry subtropical zone uh, which is the um, altitude between 1200 and 1800 meters. There's three agroecological zones. So um, high labor intensity and that's why um, there's overall labor shortages in the, um, Bhutanese agriculture. There has been the rise of low-cost electric fences. And this has been an invention of Chering Penjo, who's an agriculture engineer at the um, Research Development Center in Venka, Monga, Eastern Bhutan. And they have come up with a very low-cost fence using uh, local wood poles, using simple wire that is, um, you know, uh, you, um, manipulated with gear oil, they use HDPE pipes for insulation of the wires and this is an example of an electric fence with six strains in Wangdi. And they have reference uh, technical manuals how to do it, best practices, they train farmers. You see for instance on the left here um, how a monkey is obviously still going through the strains. Okay, then you can have monkey proof fences but they're still going to jump over it. For monkeys it's really difficult. Then for elephants in the south, they came up with special designs. For wild boars, it seems to be most effective. And um, it's a collective fence most of the time. So the community, for instance, clears the fencing area uh, for the fencing line. Uh, you see here how the community um, fixes the, the wire. You see here on the left how the fence is designed to encompass the whole village. Um, and of course, this brings some problems with it. Um, and the government pays about two-thirds of the cost. Yeah? All the energizers, all the materials that have, been, have to be brought from outside the village, the government provides. All the labor costs, the wood poles, etc., have to be provided by the lo local communities. We did a study, we is um, Christian Lippert and Cham Yang Quenzang and Kiran Subedi, colleagues from the Ministry of Agriculture in Bhutan. We did a study in 2021 published in Biological Conservation where we looked at 66 electric fencing schemes um, and we found that 80% of them are profitable even if we use a quite high discount rate of 20%. Um, 
that means the cost of capital, and we also found that the benefits are mostly dependent on labor savings, it's because there's rather low crop damages, so you can't really save much here, but you save a lot of labor, and there's an opportunity cost to labor, especially if you have now more pleasant sleep and less, uh, if, you, you know, if, if you don't have to work at night, uh, or less at night. Um, we also surveyed the cost of fences. I don't have time, and you can't read it. Uh, um, how much, you know, what's the average fencing efficiency, how much strains on average, and, and so on. Who, you know, which village has a solar-powered fence, and so on. It's all in the study. Um, but maybe I want to raise your attention to the cost. It's really low cost. Um, we found that uh, per kilometer it's 774 US dollars, compared to unelectrified fences in Africa, um, where Pecor and colleagues did a review, uh, we found this is more than 50% less of that cost. And in Nepal, another electric fence was almost three times as, uh, as expensive. Um, well, we found that they are effective. Um, also, there's, it's corroborated by um, anecdotal evidence. And there's also a national um, assessment report that also found that they're pretty effective. Depends, of course, on sometimes uh, many context issues, um, for instance, if you have a defect battery, your solar powered fence will not work, well then you, you're unlucky, you have to go back to traditional uh, mitigation strategies. And we see already until 2016, um, this was the data we used back then um, from a national inv inventory on fences, uh, almost 10% of uh, agricultural cropland was already fenced. So there was a, a strong uptake, a strong increase in, in installations. And Bhutan maybe is a good case where you could argue, well, cropland only makes up 3% of total land. 80% of the land area is forested, right? So if you now increase more and more cropland, you don't really, you know, introduce big barriers or um, or you really take away habitat from wild boars or elephants because well, it depends on the, on the regional context, but uh, I think this is a unique situation that you have such a low share in arable land. Um, problem is also people are abandoning farms because of labor shortages. Um, we have this vicious cycle between migration, abandonment of farmland, now high intensity on the remaining farmland. Now the remaining farmers have to put more labor into the garden. Now this increases drudgery of uh, rural livelihoods. Well, now people are more incentivized to abandon farms and the, th the cycle begins again. I have a plan to do, uh, use some empirical data to really also test this statistically. Uh, let's see if I can really do it. Um, and this motivates this policy scenario um, that we should move from 10% to 35% uh, fencing within a 10-year time, uh, time period using an economy-wide simulation model. I have to speed up a little bit. Yeah, uh, This model has been uh, uh, published in, in various publications before. We use it for this policy. We find that, not surprising, if we now save a lot of labor because of electric fences, our labor wages decline. For instance, here in the agroecological zone too, we see a strong drop in labor wages because now less labor is needed. We see modest increases in production, mostly for export crops like the potato, which benefits from export markets in Bhutan. Um, the problem is if we produce more prices for, and that's what we call the treadmill effect in agriculture. But still, we see um, quite some substantial welfare effects, even for, uh, on the national average, it would increase national welfare by 1%, which is, you could say, not a lot, but I mean, we are benefiting even urban households through lower um, agriculture prices. And those farmers that own land benefit most. Farmers that don't own land and only rely on labor income, they are hurt because now they face lower labor wages. And um, many, I mean, this is uh, work in progress. Um, it's preliminary results because we have not, of course, yet accounted for spillover effects from fenced communities to unfenced communities because of, obviously we could expect some diversion effects. Also, we did not capture social benefits, less social conflicts, and all these hidden um, costs. Of course, it's a collective decision. You know, how can we make sure that there's maintenance of fences? Um, and still, it's a young, fairly young technology. We don't have 20 years of experience in Bhutan of, of uh, using these fences. Yeah, so main takeaway is, um, yeah, the, 
the labor is the big problem and fences can mitigate this labor shortage. Um, and I think there's good um, circumstances to argue for an, uh, an upscaling of these fences, um, but we have to be careful of unintended consequences. So looking forward to your questions and thank you for your attention. Um, good question. Uh, I think in Nepal, I've just talked to a colleague here at the conference uh, who said, well, yeah, they're also looking into it and they have maybe the most similar kind of circumstances in Nepal, but their even land holdings are bigger. And I think that's the problem. The bigger the land holdings, and he also argued, well, it's because of the collective actions, you know, it's a cultural thing also. Do the communities really own it together? And do you find a good collaboration? Um, I'm, I haven't seen much examples of that. Um, I mean, I've tried to also find uh, the literature that discusses this in many different countries, but all, mostly on an individual farm. And we found individual fences are not profitable. Yeah, But if you can share the cost, I mean, it's geometric efficiency, right? The bigger the fence, the, the, the lower the cost of fencing one, uh, one acre. Yeah? So um, I think that then would we need, need, need more data and more insights in that. And I'm happy to hear from others of, about experiences. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I think we... Oh, good morning. Thank you. By the way, this is a red panda caught by the camera trap, uh, my favorite animal in Bhutan. <laughs>